Welcome to the T7 Learn As You Go Test 1 for Mathematics. My name is Kelly Hansen. I'm a registered nurse and a nurse educator. So let's see what we can do with math today. Sometimes a bit scary, but I know for your TEAS test, if you're taking it online, which I think most probably are, you have a calculator that's built right into it, so you don't have to worry about that. And then if, you not, if you're not taking it online for whatever reason, I believe a calculator is provided for you. So at least that part takes care of some of the stress. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna conquer math, sometimes a scary subject. We are gonna go ahead and boom, in your face, straight up, don't walk you into it nice and slow. Great big equation right here, but that's okay. We're gonna take care of it. So first thing, whenever you start, or whenever I start a math problem, I wanna know what exactly is the question asking? Because sometimes you get lots of words in there and then you get confused and what am I supposed to be doing? So number one, what is this question asking? It wants to know what are the zeros of the following scary quadratic function right here. So to start off with, we have to understand that we need to be able to set this whole thing to zero in order to figure out where these x's would make this equation true so f of x, this actually means the y-axis, and whenever the y is actually a zero, then you know that that makes your x also zero in order to cross that x-axis. So we're gonna start off with, I'm gonna walk you through this problem, and we're going to just go ahead and set the whole thing to zero to begin with. So we have zero equals two x squared minus 12 x plus 16. All right, to begin, what we, well, we didn't get my zero. There we go, zero. What we wanna do to begin with is we want to simplify this a little bit. If you take a look, we've got two, we've got 12, and we've got 16. So a factor of each one of these numbers would be the number two. So let's just go ahead and simplify this right away as our first step and get rid of that two. So we're gonna do zero equals two, and we need to put it in parentheses, x squared, minus six x and then plus eight. Sorry about that, I know my plus is kind of buried in there, but that's a plus right there. So now we have zero equals two times x squared minus six x plus eight. Okay, so now we need to figure out in this particular problem, what is x gonna equal in order to make this equation true where it actually equals zero? We need to do the uh, factoring out method. There's two different ways you can do it. Should have told you this in the very beginning, but you could, because it's a trinomial equation, you could have done the quadratic formula. That one's a little bit uh, more involved. And I think you learned it back in like seventh grade, maybe eighth grade even. But there's this little song that goes along with it. And in order to <laughs> memorize the quadratic formula, it went to the tune of Pop Goes the Weasel. At least most of my students have told me that. It was x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And that's where you would just take and you would plug in each one of these particular numbers into that equation. Now, I know that was offered as like an extra credit or something for some of uh, my students that I've pulled, but if you have any other fancy ways to memorize that quadratic formula, comment, that way we can kind of expand and make maybe a little bit more than just pop goes the weasel. But for this particular problem, because it was simple as far as the factors that they gave us, we could actually just factor out. All right, so back to this equation. We want to figure out what x should be to make it zero. So we're gonna actually just factor out here. So we've got one factor here, and we've got another factor here. So we know x, times x would give us x squared. For these other numbers right here, we need to figure out which two are actually going to add together to give us negative six, and then those same two to figure out what's gonna multiply to give us eight. So we need to look at the factors of both six and eight. So we've got two, three, and four. Those are pretty much our only options. Nothing times three is gonna give us eight, so that leaves us our two and our four. So two and four, if we wanted to add them together to give us negative six, that pretty much leaves us with negative two and negative four, because negative two plus negative four equals negative six. To check ourselves, let's make sure negative two times negative four equals eight, and that's true, because two negatives uh, multiplied together give you a positive. So now, to 
finish off our problem. What value of x is going to make it so this whole thing is zero? That's easy. So what minus two equals zero? Two, what minus four equals zero? And that's four. So if you were to do this entire problem, the whole thing would actually be equal to zero because this is a zero and this is a zero and anything times zero equals zero. So now we know our x is right here and our right here. So our answers are two and four. Let's make sure that's one of our options and it is go us. Correct. And there's a little bit more explanation here if you want to also read about it. All right, let me erase over here. And all right, question number two. What is 1.56 converted to a simplified fraction? Again, what is the question asking? It wants to know this, but the important part is we need to remember it needs to be simplified. So this decimal point here, this we need to remember this is a tenths, this is a hundredths. So that's how we know that this is really one over 56 one hundredths. So we kind of already got it into our fraction, but we need to remember the important part here is don't get tripped up. We need to know simplified because they do give you this answer right off the board, but we have to remember it's simplified. So we need to look into our factors of 56 and 100. For me, I end up probably going the hard way and just dividing it by two. So 56 divided by two is 28. And then 100 divided by two is 50. All right, take a look at that. Also a choice, but is that the most simplified? No. We can also do 28 and 50 also divided by two. So let's keep going. One and then 28 divided by two would be 14 and then 50 divided by two would be 25. Have we now gotten to a point where this can no longer be simplified? I believe the answer is yes. So over here, it does provide that answer. Let's go ahead and click it. It is the most simplified that we can do for this particular fraction. Let's check it. All right. Question number three. Andrea has six black shirts, eight white shirts, five red shirts, four blue shirts, seven gray shirts, that's a lot of shirts, and 40% of those shirts are long sleeves, what this question wants to know is how many have short sleeves. So let's go ahead and start off by adding together how many shirts does Andrea already have? So six plus eight plus five plus seven plus four. Oops, six plus eight plus five plus four plus seven. That equals a total of 30 shirts. All right, and what we already know is that 40% have long sleeves, so 40% are long, so how many of them, what percentage are short sleeves? 40 plus 60% have to be short sleeves, but that's not what the question is asking, so we need to make sure we answer it completely. In order to figure out how many are short sleeves, we need to set up our proportions. So 60% really looks like 60 over 100, and what we don't know is how many are short sleeves, but we do know the total number of shirts is 30. So what we wanna do is we want to cross multiply, so 60 times 30, this is getting our X all by itself, 60 times 30, and all of that is gonna be over 100, and that equals our X short sleeve shirts. So 30, or 60 times 30 is 180, And then, whoops, 180 divided by 100 equals 18 short sleeve shirts. Is that a possible answer? Yes, it is. And here again is a little bit more explanation if you wanna take a look at that. All right. Question, oops, 
question number four. I believe that's where we're at. In the following expression, what is the name of the mathematical symbol used to compare the two values? Okay, just like when you read, you need to read this math problem or this math equation here, expression, left to right. And that's gonna help you decide what exactly this means. Cause that's what our question is asking is what is this symbol right here? Now, <laughs> I looked this up and back in the day, like when you would have been in elementary school, this is where you would have seen those little alligators or those crocodiles. And the direction that this went, this was saying that this was the alligator's mouth. The alligator always wants to eat the bigger number and turn their back on the smaller number, number just to bring back a little bit of elementary school there. So if we were going to read this, our options are here, greater than, less than, equal to, or less than, and or equal to. So 0 0.65, is greater than because we know that that mouth is opening towards that bigger number indicating that this is the bigger number this is the smaller number so 0 0.65 is greater than 0 0.23 so let's double check our answer that is correct if it was less than what we would have seen in this section right here was the symbol that looks like this and if it had been equal to, what we would have seen is a symbol that looks like this. And if it was less than or equal to, we would have combined the two. There's our less than, and then there's our equal to. Question number five. In order to estimate the deer population in a forest, biologists obtained a sample of deer in that forest and tagged each one of them. The sample had 300 deer in total, they returned a week later, harmlessly captured 400 deer, and found that five were tagged. Using this information, which of the following is the best estimate of the total number of deer in the forest? Okay, so for those of you that got really scared with these really big long word problems, again, just ask yourself, what is this question asking me? And you can boil that down to the very last sentence here. What is the best estimate of the total number of deer? So we just wanna know the total number of deer. They give us a bunch of information that we can use to help get that total number of deer. All right, so what we're gonna start off with is we know to begin with that there were 300 tagged deer. We're just gonna write TD so we don't write the whole thing out. So we have 300 tagged deer, right? We wanna make this into a proportion. Of those tag deer, we have no idea in the very beginning how many they started with. We just know that in the beginning, they sampled and they grabbed 300 deer. So this is X for our unknown amount of deer. Unknown, unknown deer. And then what we want to make this equal to is we did figure out that when they went back they were able, of those 400 that they harmlessly captured, there's our 400 deer, that five of them were actually tagged deer. So we can assume that if once these 300 deer were tagged out of the entire population and then they were evenly put back in the forest and said, everybody scatter, make sure that you're evenly distributed in the forest, that when they went back, if they only took five of them out of the, or if they only found five were tagged out of that 400, that that would be an equal proportion. So now this is the same as what we just did with those t-shirts a little bit earlier. We just need to cross multiply. So we need to do 300 times 400 divided by five. And all of that is exactly what our unknown deer population is. So to complete that, That would be 1,000, 120,000, sorry, over five. To finish off that entire problem, that is going to give us 24,000. And that just happens to be one of our answers over here. Let's go ahead and click it and check it. Yay. There you go. All right, let's move on to number six. Okay, for lunch. 
A group of friends went to a food truck and ordered four items. That cost $11.75, $9.10, $1.80, they're eating cheap, I guess, and $10.95, respectively. Estimate how much the friends spent. Okay, so again, we got lots of information here. What exactly does the question want to know? And that's at the very end, and there's a key word in here. Estimate how much the friends spent. We don't want to overlook that estimate. So, because if what we did instead was just added up each one of these exactly, we would not find our correct answer here. So to estimate, do y'all remember how to do that? If, in this case, we want to go to the nearest whole dollar. So if it's over 50 cents, we're gonna round up to the highest dollar, and if it's below 50 cents, we're gonna round down to the nearest dollar. So that being said, let's come over here to my little white pad. The first number we're gonna do is $12 because 11.75 is greater than 11.50, that's closer to 12, so we're gonna add, round that up to 12. Next one, $9.10, that's below $9.50, it's closer to nine, so we're gonna leave that one at nine. And then $1.80, that's greater than $1.50, that's closer to $2, so we're gonna do that one up to $2. And then last but not least, $10.95, that's way closer to $11 than it is 10, it's over that 10.50. So we're gonna round that up to 11. And that entire total is gonna give us a whopping $34 for four people. That's not bad for lunch. All right, $34 is one of our options. Let's see if we're right. Yay. All right, and again, you can read the examples down here if you wanna pause and read it, and then we'll keep going. All right, question number seven. I'm gonna clear my board over here, maybe. There we go. All right, question number seven. Now I'm gonna tell you, a lot of math you do use in nursing, but these particular questions, like the ones with the proportions, the ratios, and the particular questions with the Celsius and Fahrenheit, you are gonna run into these when it comes to medications or uh, just even your NCLEX and those certain things. So these are good ones to actually really remember. All right, so our question here is, when the temperature reaches 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the children at the local pool must get out. Yikes. The current temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. How many more degrees Fahrenheit can the temperature climb before the children must get out? Again, what is our question really wanna know is how many degrees Fahrenheit can the temperature climb before the children must get out. So don't get caught up with just just figuring out what the equivalent is here, Celsius to Fahrenheit. It wants to know how much can that temperature climb. Okay, so let's start off. First, we need to figure out what is our equation to go from Celsius to Fahrenheit. And that equation is, oops, So this is Fahrenheit equals Celsius times nine fifths plus 32. Okay, this, this is just something you kind of have to remember. That's the only way you really get this. But I can tell you that one of the things that makes it easier for me is I change that nine fifths to 1.8 just because it's not as scary to me to look at a decimal versus a fraction. Okay, and then this is basically, we just need to, we're trying to figure out Fahrenheit, we just need to plug in our numbers at this point. So Fahrenheit equals, and they give us the current temperature here is 30, so we're just gonna plug in 30 times 1.8 plus 32. Okay, another thing to remember when you're figuring out this equation, do you remember this from calculus? I'm gonna write it up, maybe? No, I'm gonna write it down here. Do you remember? PEMDAS. This means that whenever you are doing your mathematical problem, there is an order of operations of what you're supposed to do first. So am I supposed to multiply here first? Am I supposed to add these two numbers here first? This tells us what we're supposed to do. P is parentheses. If you have any parentheses in your equation, you need to do that section first. E stands for exponents. If you have any exponents in your equation, that goes next. M and D 
This is multiply and divide. Those can be done at the same time. So if you see either one of those, you do either one of those. It doesn't matter which one you do first. But multiply and divide go together next, and then add and subtract are the last ones that you do. So that being said, here we need to do our multiplication first before we do our division. So 30 times 1.8 is 54 plus 32. So now we'll do our addition section. Oops, don't, I dropped my degree sign. And then 54 plus 32 equals 86. And you're like, oh, 86 is an answer here. I must have got it right. No, stop. It wants to know how much can that temperature climb before the children must get out. And remember, they have to get out when it gets to 100. So we need to make sure we come back over here and we actually finish our problem. So if we've got 100 degrees is when they have to get out and it's currently 86 degrees, that means it's got a total of 14 degrees that it can climb before those poor kiddos have to get out of the pool. And that is one of our answers here. Let's check it. Yay. And here's that same equation that I gave you over here. The way that I got 1.8 is all you do is do nine divided by five in order to find yourself uh, whatever that decimal is or the equivalent of that fraction. So I just did nine divided by five and that's what gave me that 1.8. Otherwise you can see over here they used the, the fraction itself. All right, question number eight. A jewelry store sells bracelets, necklaces, rings, and earrings. Each type of jewelry has several, several models. The number of models and sales amount per day are listed in the following table. So it gives us all the different things that we just read about that are sold, all the different types, how many models there are, and then it does also add hum amount sold of each model per day. So what is this question asking? How many pieces of jewelry are sold in a day? So it might be tempting just to come over here and be like, oh, I can do six plus five plus four plus five, and there's my answer, right? And I bet you it's one of the answers that they put down here. But what you need to remember is this is the amount sold of each model per day. So we've got three models. So what we really need to do is come over here to my whiteboard. We need to do the three models of bracelets times six sold each day. And then we've got five models of necklaces and five are sold each day. And then rings, we have six models of rings and four are sold each day. And then earrings, we have eight different models. Ooh, five are sold each day. So if we wanna know how many total pieces of jewelry there are sold every day, we need to actually add all of those up together. And if you add them all together, you get 107. Dun, dun, dun. Right there, 107. Check, make sure we're correct. That is correct. Okay, question number nine. Another scary looking one. For which two values of x are the following functions equal? Okay, so we want to figure out our value of x, right? That's what the actual question is asking. But it also wants to know about being equal. So in order to figure this out, what we're going to do is we are going to start off by setting them equal to each other. So we have 4x plus 4 is equal to x squared plus 3x, oops, boom, plus 2. All right, that's how we're gonna start it off. We want to get this whole equation set to zero. So what we're gonna do first is we are going to subtract off our three x. All the way across the board. And that gives us x plus four equals x squared plus two. We're going to subtract off our 2. We're trying to get our x's all by themselves. So we have x plus 2 equals x squared. And now we're going to subtract our x and our 2 and our x and our 2. And then that makes this whole side, if we already took away x and we took away 2, this makes this side 0. 
So 0 equals x squared minus x minus 2. Now if you can think back to the very first question that we did together, this is that same thing where we're going to end up finding what makes this equation true, what value for x is going to make this equation true that it actually is 0. And this is where we did that factoring out thing. So we did 0 equals, I remember, x times x equals x squared. So for this one, again, what plus in this number here, what two numbers when added together are going to give me a negative 1? Because that's really what's in front of this x here. You don't know it, but whenever you don't see a number in front of the x, it's always a 1. So what two numbers added together are going to give us a negative 1, but then at the same time, those same two numbers have to be able to give us a negative 2 when we multiply them together. So if we do negative 2 times 1, that's going to give us negative 2. But if we subtract negative 2 and 1, that gives us a negative 1. So in order to make this equation actually equal to 0, this would have to be 2. This is our x value. 2 minus 2 and negative 1 plus 1. So now this value is 0 and this value is 0 and then the whole thing equals 0. So that means our x's are 2 and negative 1. Is that one of our options? Yes, right here. Let you go ahead and read that for a second. All right, question number 10. Identify the dependent variable in the following equation. Okay, so what you need to know in this case, you have dependent and independent vari variables. Dependent or independent variables are ones that you can make changes to and nothing happens to that particular number. A dependent variable means that when you make changes to something else in that equation, it's going to change that dependent one as well. So if you take a look at the equation over here, you've got y and you've got x, and then you've got your other um, coefficients and whatnot here. So in this equation, which, which item would I change that would affect another one? So if I was to change x, let's say I made x 1 to begin with. So then this would be 7 plus 41 minus 75, and that would give us a value of y. But let's say I changed x and I made it 2 instead. Now we're starting to get into some more math. But obviously that's going to be a different value, so that's going to actually change y, isn't it? So whatever I do to x, it changes the value of y. So that means that x here is our independent variable, I can change it around, I can do whatever I want to, and I can make it into a different number. But every time I do, this dependent changes based on what I did over here. So that means that our dependent variable in this case is our letter Y. That is correct. All right, question number 11. A local sports event announces that it will donate 20% of all ticket sales to the children's hospital. Yay! If the event generates $4,000, how much money will be donated to charity? So what's this question I want to know again? How much money is donated to charity? So let's figure out what do we know. So it made $4,000. And 20% of that is going to go to charity. So let's go ahead over here. And we're going to figure out 20% if we're going to change that into a fraction so that we can make this into a ratio. We're going to do 20 over 100. That's the same as 20%. And we know that they sold $4,000, but we don't know what 20% of that 4000 is. So that's what our x is, our unknown amount of money. So again, we're going to do cross multiply and divide. So we're going to do 20 times 
are four thousand dollars divided by 100 and that's what equals x which is our unknown amount of no of money so we get eighty thousand dollars divided by 100 is our unknown amount of money and if we do the math the sneaky way of doing this math remember you can cross off the same amount of zeros on top and bottom so now we really have 800 over 1 which is the same as 800 that is one of our options. So this local sports event donated $800 to, to the Children's Hospital. Are we right? We are right. And this also gives you another way that you can figure it out. So if you want to go ahead and read that. All right, next question, question number 12. A young couple is saving for a new car. They currently have $3,000 saved. Every month they plan to save an additional 500. If the new car is $18,000, how many months will they need to save money? Okay, there are again, lots of words. So what exactly do we wanna know in this problem? Boom, how many months do we need to save? That's what we wanna know. How many months do we have to save? So what information do we already have? The new car, we know the price of the new car, and we know how much they've already saved. So let's go ahead and subtract off. We know the new car is $18,000. We know that these guys have been great at already doing some saving, and they've already saved $3,000. So that means that they have to come up with another $15,000. But they're still doing a great job at saving money. So they're saving $500 every single month. So if our total cost of our car itself, I'm sorry, not the total cost, but if the total remaining that this young couple has to save is 15,000, and they're already doing $500 a month, we're just gonna divide these two out. And again, this is another way you can just sneak, get rid of zero on each side, make your math a little simpler, and then five into 150, Five goes into 15 three times. Zero, bring down your last zero. And five can't go into zero, so that's zero. So that means that this young couple is gonna have to save for an additional 30 months. So not quite three years, but hopefully they can make it with the car they've got. 30 months, let's go ahead and check. And there you go. All right, question number 13. 12 is what percentage of 80? So we wanna know what the percentage of 80 is. So what they've already given us is we've got 12 out of 80, and that is what percent. Remember, to make something a percent, you put it over 100. So in this case, we're going to cross multiply and divide. So 12 times the 100 divided by 80 equals our x. So we have 1,200 over 80 equals x. And if we get rid of our zeros, 120 divided by 8 is our 15%. That's one of our choices. Here we go. Question number 14. Yay, a nursing question. Kinda, nursing math. A nursing home is analyzing how many nurses are available to help its residents. The ratio of nurses to residents is two to seven, which that's gonna be important once you start working. What is that ratio that you're taking care of your patients? If there are 56 residents, there are blank nurses working at the nursing home. Don't get scared just because it's a fill in the blank. It's okay, if you know your math, you're gonna get it right. So let's figure out what it wants to know, how many nurses are working in the nursing home. That's what it wants to know. What does it give us? It gives us what the ratio of nurses to residents is at that nursing home, so we can figure that out. 
So we know that for every, for every two nurses, they have seven residents. And overall, to figure out how many are totally working there, we know the entire nursing home itself has 56 residents. So we can very easily figure out our X, which stands for our total number of nurses that work there. Again, we're gonna get very comfortable with our cross multiply and divide. So we're gonna do two times 56 divided by seven equals our X total, should have written that up here, total nurses. Two times 56 is going to give us, oops, I'm just gonna do it right down here. And we're gonna do 112 divided by seven, and that's going to get us a total of 16. So X, which is our total nurses, equals 16. Let's give it a check. Yay, correct. And you can see they set up the same proportion here. Okay, number 15. Okay, so identify the value of the y-intercept in the following function. We have f of x, which stands for y, and our y equals mx plus b, if you think back to um, algebra one. This is our mx section here, and this is your uh, slope of the line. Remember, rise over run. And then this is where it, this stand for, this number stands for where it actually crosses the y axis. And that's exactly what y intercept means is where it's actually crossing, where it's intercepting that. So our actual answer is given right to us right here in negative 18. All right, question number 16. Oh, another good nursing one because when you have to do intake and output, you will have to be able to keep track of how much your patients are drinking. So this question, a patient has been instructed to drink a gallon of water each day. That is a lot. So these are obviously not congestive heart failure patients. How many cups does the patient need to drink? So this is where you have to do uh, your equivalents and just work your math down from there. All right, and again, what does the question want to know? How many cups does the patient need to drink if they were told they have to drink an entire gallon? So we're gonna start off with what we already do know. And what we do know, I'm gonna try to write small and start up here, is that two cups, we're just gonna write C for cups, that equals one pint. And then we do know that two pints equals one quart. And then we know that four quarts equals one gallon. So what we need to do is we need to get from here cups all the way down here to gallons to figure out how many cups the patient has to drink. So we're just gonna make our equation as we go along. So we've got one gallon is equal to four quarts in one gallon is equal to two pints in one quart, and then you've got two cups in one pint. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply all the way across. So we've got four times two, which is eight, times two, which is 16. So if we were to cross off all of these, we've got quarts, quarts, pints, pints, that leaves us with cups in a gallon. So this patient needs to drink a total of 16 cups. That's a lot of drink. <laughs> and again, it's written out right here for you. Okay. A local taxi company charges an initial fee of $3 plus 80 cents for every mile traveled. If the taxi travels 10 miles, how much is that trip gonna cost? 
So our question is asking, how much does the trip cost? So we're going 10 miles, we know that, and we know for every mile, it's gonna, they're gonna charge us 80 cents. So we've got our 10 miles, sorry about the handwriting, times 80 cents per mile, oops, per mile. We're just gonna do our multiplication here. Zero times zero is zero, that's zero. Eight times zero is zero, and eight times one is eight. And remember, whenever you have your decimal points, however many decimal points positions you have up in your problem up here, that's how many you have to put down in your answer. So we wanna go over two decimal points, one and two. We wanna go one, two. Remember, you always have that invisible one after your last one. So we know it's eight dollars to go 10 miles. But is that all it is? We cannot forget, they've also given us another piece of information here. It's $3 also just to hop in that taxi. So we wanna add on our $3 to this to give us a total, oops, <laughs> of $11. So $11 total to travel in this taxi. And it's written out here for another, another way if you wanna take a look at that. Give you a couple options for whatever works best for you in the way that you learn, particularly with math. There's multiple ways often to find the same answer, so it's kind of whatever works best for you. All right. Question 18. Oh, here's our Fahrenheit Celsius thing again. The thing that you definitely need to learn and remember how to do and memorize that equation because you're definitely going to see that throughout your nursing career. The temperature at Sam's house was 95 degrees Fahrenheit. That's kind of toasty. You must live in Texas or something like that. What was the temperature in Celsius? So we want to do that same equation that we did before. So the equation that we have is All right, so we remember that our equation for the conversion from uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius is the Fahrenheit equals Celsius times 9 fifths plus 32. And remember we talked about this, that that actually could be 1.8. I'm gonna put a times in here because that just, I don't know, it's throwing me off. Plus 32. But the thing with this one is that it already gives us the Fahrenheit. So you could either change this entire equation up to get Celsius out here to show us, and then you could just plug in your Fahrenheit, or we can work with what we've got. So let's just try working with what we have. We know that the house is 95 degrees Fahrenheit. What we don't know is our Celsius, but we're still gonna times 1.8 and 32. So we're gonna try to get C Celsius by itself. So let's subtract off our 32 on this side. Whatever you do to one side, you gotta do to the other side. So there's 63 degrees Fahrenheit is Celsius times 1.8. We wanna do the opposite to get rid of this number on this side so we can isolate our Celsius. So we're gonna divide by 1.8 1 on this side and then we're gonna divide by 1.8 on this side and that's gonna get Celsius all by itself so that we can figure out what exactly that was. And that number 63 divided by 1.8 is 35. And that does happen to be one of our options over here. So we'll click on it. And that is correct. See, this is what I was telling you about. You can, even before you plug in any of your numbers, you can flip your equation around. And, and instead of doing it after you have all the numbers plugged in, you could just isolate C first by itself. And that's what they've shown you here or you can plug in the numbers that you currently have and then just work it backwards, whatever way is easiest for you. And again, just to remind you, the way I got 1.8 here was, it was the nine divided by five. Whenever you're given a fraction, if you wanna change it to a decimal, you just always divide nine divided by five, whatever the top divided by the bottom is. Okay, question number 19. 
There are 99 boys per every three grade levels at a local high school. How many boys are there in seven grade levels? Okay, so we, what do we wanna know? We wanna know how many boys in seven grade levels, but they tell us that for every three grade levels that there are 99. So we're gonna just make our little equation over here. We know that in, there are 99 boys, I guess we should write out boys, for every three grade levels. But how does that equate when we have seven grade levels? How many boys do we have? And this is our favorite, cross multiply and divide. So we're gonna do 99 times seven divided by three, and this gives us how many boys there are in the total seven grades. So we'll do 99 times seven. Try not to make you look too much sideways. And then six, 93 divided, I should have written times divided by three here. That's gonna give us two, bring down our nine, three, and then bring down our three. That's gonna give us 231 boys and a total of seven grades. And that is one of our options over here. So let's go ahead and click it, double check ourselves. Yay. And you can see the explanation there. You can go ahead and read that. Make sure that it makes sense to you. All right. Question number 20. The table below shows tickets purchased during the week for entry to the local zoo. What is the mean of adult tickets sold for the week? So what is this question asking? What is the mean of adult tickets sold? So mean, what does that mean? Mean in math is the average. So what we need to do is we need to add together all of the tickets that were sold, but don't get tricked. It's gotta be only for adults, because if you look down here at this chart, it shows us adults and children. So we're gonna add together all of the adult tickets, and then we're gonna divide by how many days of the week they were total. So let's go ahead and gather that information to begin with. So we see for Monday, for adults, we sold 22. Then the next category down here is still Monday, but look, that's child, so let's not get pulled into that trap. We're not adding in that 30. Tuesday, for adults, we want to add in 16. So let's just do this as we go. There's Tuesday. The next Tuesday, it shows you for children. So then it's Wednesday. Here's Wednesday adults for 24. We're gonna add in our 24. And then we're gonna skip down to Thursday. Thursday right here for adult is 19. So let's add in our 19. And then Friday for adults is 29. So we have a total of 110 adult tickets were sold. And how many days did we sell them in? We sold them in one, two, three, four, five days total. So we're gonna divide this by five days. And then the answer that we are going to get is here's two, two times five is 10. Bring down your one. And then two times five is also 10. So we have no remainders. We know that our answer should be 22. And there it is. Let's make sure we are correct and we didn't get tricked. Very good. Here's another simplified way of looking at it. Same thing that we just did. We had just added them up step by step. Go ahead and read that, make sure it makes sense. All right, moving on to question 21. Yay, another Celsius Fahrenheit, another nursing question. Do you remember our equation? Okay, so we've got Fahrenheit equals Celsius times 9 fifths plus 32. 
we can also write this as Fahrenheit equals Celsius times 1.8 plus 32. And don't forget our PEMDAS, parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, addition, subtraction. So we need to make sure that we're doing our multiplication first. And it gives us what our Celsius is. That's 37 times 1.8 plus 32. So we're going to do our multiplication first. 37 times 1.8. those all together, six, six, six. And we know we need to have one decimal point in there. So 66.6 .6 was what our product was of multiplying these two together. And we need plus 32. F equals 66.6 .6 plus 32 is six. 98.6. So if you ever take the temperature of a patient and your thermometer happens to be in the Celsius mode and you get 37, then you know that your patient has a perfect 98.6 degree temperature. Let's just check ourselves. That is correct. All right, question 22. According to the legend, that means what's described here, what's given you, shown, and what it describes. So these are all the pictures or the, the colors of the bar graph. The legend is what, is what helps you decide what stands for what. What is the darkest black color indicate in the chart below? So find the darkest black, boom, 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 boom. Find the darkest black in your legend. This is what this is, it tells you what it is, and it is the number of rabbits. Household three has a lot of rabbits. And that is correct. Here's your legend, and that's all it was asking for is what is it showing? All right, question 23. We have our equation here. What is the result of negative six times negative nine divided by three. So we're just gonna go right across the board and we're gonna do what is negative six times negative nine. Negative six times negative nine. When you have two negatives and you multiply them together, that's gonna give you a positive. So negative six times negative nine is 54. And then we've got 54 divided by three looks like this. And then eight times three is 24. So this should equal 18. And we are correct. Eva Jane is practicing for an upcoming 5K. She has recorded the following times in minutes. 25, 18, 23, 28, 30, 22.5, 23, 33, and 20. So lots of times she's been practicing a good bit. So what does the question want to know? Question wants to know what is the mode of Eva Jane's times? Mode, now we have to remember back to our statistics and some of our other math classes what exactly does mode mean? Mode means the number that is used the most frequently or occurs the most frequently. So we're gonna look through these numbers here. 25, as far as I can see, is only used once. 18 is only used once. 23, I see two 23s. So, so far that's our top runner right there. 28, only used once. 30 is only used once. 22.5 is only used once. We talked about 23 already. 33 is only used once and 20 is only used once. So that means that if we're looking for the number that is that is present the most frequently, 23 has is our winner because it's in there twice. So let's double check. And there you go.
Moving on to question number 25. For a research study, an interviewer asked a student to estimate how long he has played video games over the past several days. Would this be scary to ask you? The student said he played for around 32 minutes on Monday, 58 minutes on Tuesday, and 117 minutes on Wednesday. Approximately how much time did the student spend playing video games? So our question wants to know, of all of those minutes, how much approximately did he spend playing video games? Now this is where you have to remember how to equate your minutes to hours so that you don't get all confused here. So we know that 60 minutes equals one hour because we want to know that if you look at our answers here, they want everything in hours and yet they give us everything in minutes as far as our information. So let's just go through and remember, look for the keywords in here it's asking for estimate. So we're gonna try to round to the nearest hour. All right, so 32 minutes, this is over 30 minutes, which would be about halfway, right? It's, well, let's, let's leave this one at 30. Let's leave this one at 30. So we'll do 30 minutes for this one. Second one is 58 minutes. Okay, that's pretty darn close to one hour. So let's do one hour for that. And then 117 minutes on Wednesday. Be careful with this one. Remember that 60 minutes is one hour. So this is actually, if we took 60 minutes plus 60 minutes, that's 120. That's really pretty close to two hours. So let's just make this last one here is two hours. So now we can just add up. We've got three hours and 30 minutes for estimate. So if we were going to put this all in hours, this would be closer to the 3.5 because this is about a half of an hour, correct? 30 minutes. So let's try 3.5, see how we did. Yay. Okay, number 26. Convert four-fifths to a decimal. Don't get scared. This is just like what we've been doing with the Celsius problem where it was nine over five in order to turn that into 1.8. To change any fraction into a decimal, all you have to do is take the top divided by the bottom. So the top divided by the bottom. So five can't go into four, correct? So we're gonna put our decimal point in a zero, and then make sure that we bring our decimal point up here. But we know that five can go into 40, right? It can go in eight times. So our answer is 0.8. Now you gotta remember in nursing, you really always should write this as 0 0.8, just so that that point doesn't get lost. So here is 0 0.8, and that is correct. It's like slowing down. The, the camera's lagging a little bit. <gasps> oh yeah, it did that last time too, didn't it? For why? Is it maybe it's when you're writing? I just haven't noticed. Has it been every time I've written? I think so. I don't think so. No, I didn't even notice it when you were pointing at it. Do you need me to fix something on that one? No, I don't think so. Okay. All right, question twenty seven. Triple the difference of five, and a number is equal to the sum of that number and five. What is the number? Excuse me, I need to pause for this one for a second because this one made me think. Okay. Triple the difference of five and a number, and a number, okay, is equal to the sum of that number and five. Okay, so what I would do with this question because it, it, it gets kind of confusing, is I'm gonna write this just as I read it from left to right. So, come over here to this side. We're going to triple Okay, so we're gonna triple the difference of five in a number. So, Here's, remember, subtraction, the way that that product is called is the difference. So triple this difference of five and a number, 
and this is equal to the sum of that number and five. So we're gonna say that X is that number. What is that number? So we need to get our X's on one side by themselves so that we can solve this. So we're gonna do 15 minus three X. All we did was distribute that three through equals X plus five. And let's get rid of the five over here. Oops. So 10 minus three X equals X. And then let's add this three X to this side. Remember, whatever you do to one side, you gotta do to the other. So 10 equals four X. Now let's get X all by itself. So divide by four X equals 10 divided by four. Now we know two. Two point five. Did we do it right? Dun dun dun. Yes, here we go. So again, just it, it was difficult. When you read something that's like this, just stop, slow down. And if you have to, just write it off to the side so that you can kind of process all of it. That was the only way that I could really understand it was just to write it as I read it. And that's exactly what they have done here as well. All right, 28. If Sandy can bike eight miles in 25 minutes, how many miles can she bike in 55 minutes? Okay, so what we wanna know is how many miles can she bike in 55 minutes, but the information that they give us tells us that she can do eight miles in 25 minutes. What we don't know is how many miles she can do in 55 minutes. So this is going to be our cross multiply and divide. So we have eight times 55 divided by 25 equals X miles. And let's, for the sake of simplicity, let's use that built-in calculator that you will have for your t-test if you are going to be, or for your t's, if you are going to be taking this online. So let's do eight times our 55 divided by 25, and that's gonna give us 17.6, which does happen to be a choice over here. Go ahead and click on that. And there you go. Okay, number 29. Emma bought four notebooks at $2.50 each. Let's just write this down. Four notebooks at $2.50 each, and she bought three boxes of pencils. If she gave the cashier a $20 bill, how much change would she receive? Okay, so we need to figure out, first of all, four times $2.50. We just do a little bit of math. That's gonna equal us $10 and then $1.35 times three times three, that gives us $4.05. So she spent a total of $14.05. We know that she gave the cashier $20, so we just need to subtract how much she spent out of that $20 to figure out what her change would be. Minus five dollars and ninety-five cents should be the change that she gets back. And there you go. Question number thirty. Sort these elements. List the values in order from least to greatest. So these are the three values that were given. And look, they're all in different uh, forms. This one's a decimal, this one is a percentage, and this one is a fraction. So we need to figure out how can we equate these all to be the same thing so we can figure out which one's least, 
middle and greatest. So let's choose which one we want to change it to. We could change all of these to a percent. We could change them all to a decimal, all to a fraction. I think what I might do in this case is I might change these all to a, um, a decimal. So we know that we already have the first decimal is given to us, 0.42. Remember how to change fractions into decimals? So a 98% is just the same as 98 over 100, which is just the same as 0.98. And then the last one is 1 third. 1 divided by 3 is going to give us a decimal of 3.3333. Lots of 3's repeating. But it puts it in a form that we can figure out now which one's least and which one's greatest. So we're just going to click and drag for this. As you can see, 0.33 is the smallest out of all of them, followed next by 0.42 and then 0.98. So the important thing was just to get them all into something that you could compare them to, whether it been all fractions or all percentages or all decimals, something to compare them. All right, and there's a little explanation for you. Thirty-one. Which of the following pairs of angles could not be the smaller and larger interior angles of a parallelogram? All right. So, what is this question asking? What could not be the smaller and larger interior angles of a parallelogram? Let's see if I can actually draw a parallelogram, like from what I can remember. Okay. So, this would be a larger interior one. Let's make this an L because it's greater than 90 degrees, right? And then this would be a smaller one because it's less than 90 degrees. So we know that the total amount with a parallelogram, if I was to draw a straight line here, that this angle plus the angle on the other side of the parallelogram, this is going to equal 180 degrees because on this line, this is a 180 degree angle. Okay, so which ones could not be the smaller and larger interior angles? Okay, so, so we know that with the parallelogram, the, the addition of the small angle plus the remaining side both of these two together need to equal 180. So if you go through all of your pairs that are given here, you can see that 120 plus 60 is 180. 125 plus 55 gives you 180. 110 plus 60 does not give you 180. It only gives you 170. And then 20 plus 160, that gives you 180. So we're going to choose this one as our could not be the smaller and larger. And there's your explanation there. Question 32. All right, question number 32. What is the missing length x? So we have our triangle here, and you can see that based on the information given to us in this triangle, it's got this little box down here. This tells us that this is a 90 degrees, so this is a right triangle. And they give us the sides of 6 and they give us the sides of 8 and then x is our unknown. So one of the things when you know that you have a right triangle you can use, think back to Algebra 1 again, you can use the Pythagorean Theorem and that is, I'll write it down over here, that is your a squared plus b squared equals c squared. This is probably one of the equations that everybody remembers from math class. So all you gotta know now is which one fits where. Which one's a, which one's b, which one's c. So what you need to know is that c, right here, c, this is your longest side because it's opposite to the largest angle. So your 90 degree angle in this triangle is your largest one. This one's smaller and this one is smaller. So we know that this is going to be the longest side. So that means that A and B are our other two numbers here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take six squared plus eight squared equals C squared. We don't know what C squared is. So six squared is 36 
plus 8 squared is 64 equals c squared. We'll add these two together. That gives us 100. And now we know that 100 is c squared, but that's not our answer right here because we still need to finish off the problem. We need to take the square root of c squared and the square root of 100, and that's going to give us 10. So we know that our answer here for x is 10. Let's just double check ourselves. Correct. And there you go. All right, moving on to question 33. In a survey, a direct relationship exists between the amount of money made and satisfaction levels. What does this relationship mean? Select all that applies. Those are always scary questions. Select all that applies. All right, first of all, let's figure out what does a direct relationship actually look like? So when I think about this, I think of my, I don't know if you want to call it a graph or what, I'm going to think of something that looks kind of like this. And this line here, we're going to say this is the amount of money made. And then this side, I'm going to think of this side as level of satisfaction. I'm just going to write satisfaction. And basically, as I move up in money, I'm also moving up in satisfaction. So it kind of looks something like this. So what can we say about this picture here that makes sense? Is there a negative relationship? So we're only moving in the positive direction here. If we we're moving in the negative direction, that wouldn't be visible on this particular chart. So we're not saying it's a negative relationship, but we are saying that there is a positive relationship that we can see. As we move up in money, it appears as though we're moving up in satisfaction. And we can also say a change in one variable means a proportional change in the other. Again, if I am going to increase my salary by, let's say, $20,000, it looks as though I'm also moving up on satisfaction level over here. So we could say that that would be the case. And then if there is an increase in money, satisfaction levels will drop. Well, that doesn't really make sense because as we just said, as we move up in money, we're also showing how this line is moving also up the satisfaction levels. So I'm going to say that B and C are the two that make sense in our select all that apply. And I'm going to give you a couple seconds to go ahead and read through this to make sure that it made sense to you. And you can always pause and get some further clarification if you need to. All right, question number 34. A box is filled with blue, purple, and red stickers. If one-fifth of the stickers are blue and two-thirds are purple, what fraction of the stickers are red? Okay, so we have one that we do not know. So we are going to figure out, first of all, we need to get these so that we can compare them. In order to do so, we need to get the same common denominator in there. So I want to start off first. Let's do, let's just do blue. We know that the blue are one-fifth, and we know that purple are two-thirds. If I'm going to look at the, denom the denominators of both of these, I'm going to see that 5 and 3 have a common, let's just do change it to 15. So in order to get to 15, I need to multiply the top by 3 in the blue case, and I need to multiply the bottom by 3, and I get 15. So in order to get 15 on the bottom to give us equal denominators, I need to multiply 3 by 5, so that gives me 15. But whatever I did to the bottom, I need to do to the top. So I'm going to multiply 2 by 5. Okay, so now we know out of 15 total stickers that 3 fifteenths are blue, 10 fifteenths are purple, that just leaves us with the question of how many fifteenths do we have of red? Well, if we do 3 plus 10, that's 13. That tells me that red has to be 2 fifteenths. And let's just double check, make sure that we are correct. 
and we are. Question 35, almost there. On the first four tests this semester, a student received the following scores out of 100, a 74, a 76, 82, and 84. The student must earn at least what score on the fifth test to receive a B in the class. Let's face it, we all do this. Getting towards the end, getting to finals, you wanna know exactly what you need to get on your final exam in order to be able to pull out whatever letter grade you want. This is a good thing to know how to do. Assume that the final test is out of 100, and we're not saying that this final test is weighted any differently, it's the same as all the rest, and that to receive a B in the class, he must have an 80%. So in this class, to get an, a B, you have to have an 80. So let's figure out what does this person have to make on their fifth test, because that's what it wants to know in order to get a B. So we are going to start off over here. We're going to add up all of the test grades that we do know. We know that they made a 74. We know they made a 76, an 82, and an 84. But what we don't know is what we need on that last test. Remember, we're going to do an average. And an average means that we divide by the total number of tests. So that'd be one, two, three, four, and five. And what we need this to equal to get our B is 80%. So let's just go ahead and figure out how to figure out what X is from there. So we're gonna add together, boom, 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 boom. That gives us 316 plus X. Because we multiplied by five to get rid of the, fra or the fraction on that side, multiply this side by five, and that's gonna give us 400. Does that make sense? To put this, uh, to get rid of this in a fraction form, we multiply by five on this side, so therefore we have to multiply by five on this side. So now we have 316 plus X equals 400. Now let's get rid of 316 on this side so that we can put X all by itself, and that's gonna give us 84, so we know that this person better study because they're going to need to do as well as they did on the top, one of their top scores in order to get a B. So let's choose 84, and there you go. All right, number 36. The sides of a triangle have the following lengths, 4 inches, 4 inches, and 7.5 inches. If the smallest angle within the triangle has a measurement of 20 degrees, what is the measure of the largest angle? All right, you can already see that we have two equal sides in this triangle, and then we have the longer side. The measurement of all of the angles within a triangle have to equal 180 degrees. So we can say that if this is the smallest angle, then we have this correlating with the smallest side. So that means that we have two 20 degree angles. Oops. So we know we already have 20 degrees that correlates with our four inch side. And then therefore it's gonna have another 20 degree because we have the same side. And then what we don't know is what the 7.5 inch side looks like, but we know it all has to equal 180. So that's 40 plus X equals 180. We could take off our 40 if we need to go this far and know that X equals 140. Let's check ourselves. That is correct. All right, question number 37, two to go. If an investor was interested in seeing the change in price over time of a certain stock, what kind of graph or chart would be best to use? So they give us four different options here, and what we wanna know again is the best graph or chart to use to show a change in price over time. Okay, so a line graph, mm, I'm thinking that's probably a pretty good answer right there, but let's just double check all the rest of them. Pie charts. Pie charts are not very good because those would show you the percent of a whole, 
but not so good at showing us change in price over time. A Venn diagram, those are that's a diagram that's put together to show common uh, commonalities and differences, so that really doesn't apply. And a bar graph, a bar graph uh, is a, a good graph, but in this case, it's not the best graph because it's not going to be able to show you as much in real time the changes that happen in price. So we're going to choose the line graph as being our top choice. And that is correct. And it gives you a little bit more information down here that you can read over those. Last problem. Here we go. What is the product? Product is always the, re the result of multiplication. So what is the product of 6.23 times 4.5? So let's just come on over here and let's just do 6.23 times 4.5. And we'll just do this simple multiplication. And didn't leave myself a whole lot of room. We're going to add up everything here at the end. Now the important thing to remember, and again, if you're using a calculator, you're going to get this correct, but you need to make sure that however many places, decimal places there are in your question that you have that many in your answer. So we have one. If we move this, we have one, two, and then don't forget about this guy, three. So we need to go one, two, three. So our answer here is 28.035, and we are correct. We did it. We finished all 38 questions, and I'm hoping that with some explanation and just stopping and thinking about your questions, and exactly what is the question asking and looking for those key words so that you don't miss some of the important information that this was really helpful to you. Again, feel free to give us any comments or questions below and good luck on your teeth.